the world is looking at the church. Now when the world looks at the church, what are we showing them? First of all, the world represents all unsaved people. But the church represents all that are born again in Christ. So when the world looks at the church, what are we showing them? What do they see? Are they seeing a people full of faith? F-A-I-T-H. Ready to run through a troop and jump over a wall. Or uh, is the world seeing a people full of strife and confusion, lack of power, void of any faith in God? For the Bible already said that without faith, it is impossible to please God, and he that comes to God must believe that he heals, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seeks him. So when the world unsaved people, when they look at the church, all born again saints, what are we showing them? What do they see? Oh, you may as well be honest with yourself. Now, there was a word on the pages of the Bible that is called sanctified. Mm -hmm. Now, when the word sanctified is defined biblically, it simply means to set apart. God has set apart believers from the world so that we can represent him in the earth. It has become the responsibility of the church. All born again believers, it has become our responsibility to represent God all over the world. But it's difficult, I want y'all to be very careful because I want to say this slow. It is difficult for some to understand this concept because they can seem to identify themselves as the church opposed to going to a building on Sunday where they have service. Let me take time and make sure that you understand what I'm saying. I am a teacher. A lot of people that are saved and born again. Have not identified the fact that God see you, even though you are an individual. God see you as a member of the church. But you haven't identified yourself as the church because you keep thinking the church is nothing but a building on a corner in a certain geographical area in a city. Do I have a witness in anybody? So you have to be able, number one, to identify yourself as someone that God has set apart for his use. Use in doing what? Representing him on this earth. Representing him on the earth for what? Because if a person want to get to heaven, first of all, they got to come in contact with the church. Everybody don't get saved in a building, in a church building. There are some people that get saved on a corner because God got some faithful witnesses out there that knows how to do more than ask somebody, do you know Jesus? Have you, do you know God? Are you going to heaven? But you have somebody that have allowed themselves to be yielded to the Spirit of God in such a way that God on any corner can allow his spirit to reveal something about that person to whom you are witnessing so that they will understand that obviously there is something about this person. So you are 
a representative of God in the earth, whether you have accepted it or not. See, first of all, you can't identify yourself as 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 uh, the church yourself. You can't identify yourself as the church because you keep thinking the church is a bill. First of all, let, let, let's get a little deep. Let's just say when we move out of church for the six out of this building. We moved out of the building for six and a half months and what have you. I still preach the word. For six and a half months, I sat in front of the computer and I talked to the very best of my ability. Amen. But yet we had several people from this church who say that I really can't get involved. I need to be around other people. I need to be in the church. You are the church. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. I'm happy. Are you listening to me? And, and, and so, David made the statement. He said that when I don't have anybody around me to encourage me, I have to encourage myself. Amen. And so, I want to, somebody to tell me, what's the difference in me talking to you? I'm your pastor, you know me. You're looking at me on television. What's the difference in that and seeing me here? The word is the same. See, the problem is you have not identified yourself as the church. You keep saying to yourself that I got to go to a building before I have church. See, and, and until you identify yourself as that, you will never be able to be used by God because of your behavior. Because, first of all, Will you ask yourself the question, what would Christ do in a situation like this? Would Christ curse that lady out? Would Christ take advantage of that person? Would Christ be gossiping? Would Christ not come to church? Hmm? Would Christ not pay his tithes? Would Christ not give offering? Are you listening to me? So, whether you realize it or not, we are being held responsible for what we understand. And so, let me give you the subject once again. I'm talking about the world is looking at the church. Now, if somebody came to you and asked and said to you, the building is going to get together and pray about certain issues. First of all, you're going to look at them like they're crazy. The building don't get together and pray about certain issues. You wouldn't say that. You would simply say the church is going to get together and pray about certain issues. Are you listening to me? Now, the problem is the people of God have not understood their true identity and purpose. Therefore, we misrepresent God before the world through our behavior. Mm. Let me say it again. Let me make sure you understand what I'm saying. See, I like, I like when I, I stand before you and teach or whatever, I can go off on these side notes. See, but what I'm teaching or telling you, I can't, I can't go to the side notes or whatever. Right. Are you listening to me? See, I can say, are you listening to the one I'm standing in front of me? Yeah. I can say, are you going to pray with me? See, but I kind of cut that out when I was on to right. you. Right. But it's coming back. And, right. and so, people have not understood uh, their true identity and their true purpose as far as the church is concerned. Therefore, we misrepresent God through our behavior we misrepresent him through our behavior because some of the bad habits that we had prior to getting saved and coming into the church, some of us still have some of those bad habits. And when the world looks at the church, they see you and your bad habits and God get the blame. Have you ever tried to invite somebody to church? So why don't you come and visit my church? And have you ever heard anybody say, well, you know, 
Ain't nothing going on in the church. What? You know, when the people in the church start acting and behaving, right? And when God, or if God bless you, then come back and tell me, why would a person make a statement like that? Since they, they, they never seen God. Why would somebody make, a, make a, a statement about God like that? They ain't never seen God. The closest thing that they have seen to God is you. Why could you say that, Pastor Reed? Number one, because you are his witness and you represent him, and we are misrepresenting God in this earth because of our behavior. Because of the bad habits that we have that we refuse to deal with. Now, when I come to the pulpit on Sunday morning, or in your private time when you're reading, you hear things that I say up here that you are guilty of doing. But you don't make a correction. You read things in the Bible that cause you to feel guilty or that can, can, can convict you, make you feel bad, but you don't change it. And you take that behavior with you because it's a part of you. And when somebody in the world see you, they see your behavior, and then God get to blame. I don't want to go to no church. What's going on in the church? People in church complain. People in the church lying. Men in, in the church that have high responsibilities, they're looked upon as, as leaders, and they get found with somebody else's wife that don't belong to them. And, and see, don't tell me, the media will slam this on television. And the whole world is saying, so when I ask the question, I'm, I'm asking a legitimate question, when the world is looking at the church, what do they see? Why would I want to become a part of that? See, I, I'm glad I found God when I did. Because it seemed that as time continues to press in the future, it's harder and harder to get to know God. See, the same word is being preached, but the devil, you know, he's doing the same stuff or whatever, but me and heart have gotten hard hearted. I don't want to hear nobody preaching to me. How can you tell me what to do? I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I am simply the messenger giving you the message that if you don't get it right here, you will never see the Father. Well, a loving God won't send anybody to hell. Have you ever heard anybody say that? A loving God won't send anybody to hell. And a loving God won't. See, first of all, we did communion this morning. That is a part to show you that a loving God don't want to send anybody to hell because he became a man, died on the cross so that you don't have to go. But if you do go, you made the choice. You made the choice to wind up in that place and you will not be able to blame anybody but yourself. Can you see what kind of privilege you have? Can you see the responsibility that God has placed on you? You represent him, I represent him in the earth. Every time I go out in public, I'm representing Christ. See, because first of all, if I look at it like this, and if I come to understand this, I don't belong to myself anymore. I forfeited my life when I declare that Jesus became my Lord and Savior. I forfeited my life. I died to self that I might live for him. Amen. And therefore, I'm saying, Lord, not my will, but let Amen. your will be done. Amen. So dear Norris, yes. Amen. you have come to understand that you're my representative in the earth. So I want you to behave it. I want you to live it, and I want you to talk it, so that when people see you, they'll see me in you. Amen. Amen. I wonder, you know, Pam and I, we, we, we talk a lot, and I, and I complimented her yesterday. In so many words, I didn't say, Pam, I'm going to compliment you, but I'm saying, as, Pam, you know, as we talk, as you always tell me that, the people where you work, 
they always have high regard for you. And I said, that's because of your behavior on the job. Because what Pam has done, she has, has placed her hands in the hand of the Lord and said to the Lord, I will live for you wherever I am. So she doesn't get involved in the politics that goes on on the job. She don't get involved when somebody comes to her and says, well, Pam, how come you're not uh, decorating your desk for Halloween or whatever? Pam don't have to say, well, I don't believe that's devilish. Well, yeah, I just choose not to do it. You don't have to tell them that it's devilish. You don't have to, you don't have to get all involved in that or whatever. You just simply be a child of God and say that I choose not to do it. Now, who has control of your tongue? Mm -hmm. you. Except you. <laughs> and did you not know that the Bible said that the tongue no man can tame? Right. The only thing that can tame your tongue is the word of God. Amen. In other words, you've got to yield to the word to keep your tongue from saying something that's going to get you in trouble. Yes, Lord. Yes. And I like to say this all the time. Yes, Lord. Before a word ever become a word, it's a thought first. Thoughts are formulated in the mind. But you release it by way of the tongue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how I know what you are thinking. Yeah. See, did you not know that you can think all day and I'll never be able to read your mind? I only know how foolish you are when you so open your mind. That's right. yeah. So the devil realizes that when you begin to open your mouth, he got you. Yeah. Because the thoughts that you speak sometimes are implanted in your mind by the enemy. When you start speaking it, he said, I know that we have him because he's saying what we're putting in his mind. So therefore the Bible says life and death is in the power of one's tongue. So you got to be very careful about what you say because you represent God. You got to live your life in such a way because there are people in the world that need to see some godly behavior out of the body of Christ. See, but you don't understand that you have, you have, you have forfeited your life. Anybody know what forfeit means? That you have given up. <laughs> and what did I give it up for? First of all, let, let's look beyond life. I gave it up for eternal life. All right. But I give it up now for favor from God. So I can say without a shadow of a doubt, he's my refuge and my strength. He's my very present help in the time of trouble. He said he will never leave me nor yes. forsake me, yes. that I might boldly say the Lord is my helper, and I should not fear what man shall do to me. He said, Lord, if you call me, I'll answer you. Amen. He said, when you call me, I'll show you greater than my thing that thou knowest not. Amen. That's what I gave of my life for. Oh. Amen. Amen. The devil tried to take my life with multiple sclerosis. And the Lord told me, he said, the devil, this was prophesied to me in 1989, he said, the devil is going to try and take your life with the same disease your sister died with. But notice this, my son, I have taken it away from you and you will live and not die. But I had to actually go through that. I felt the pain. And the Lord told me, he reminded me, he said, do you remember what I told you? He said that I told you that you will live and not die. And here I am. But guess what now? That is a testimony that I have to the goodness of God. Yeah. I can testify to the fact that God is a healer. I can simply say this. I can say that God, Christ was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace is upon him with the stripes. I was healed. But not only do I say it, I have experienced it. Right. I know for a fact that this word bear witness to the living God because the word is living. Mm -hmm. And so the world is looking at the church. Now when you got saved, whether you understand this or not, that God placed his light in you. Yes. Thank you. Did you not know that in darkness you are seen because of the light of God? Don't you think that today we know whether or not you say the born again? Whether you behave it or not? See, the devil want to keep you unproductive. If my mother, my friends were unproductive, I never would have got to know God, not by them. So his light in us shines in dark places. 
And when I say it's light in the sky and the dark places, what kind of light do you bring to the areas where you go? What kind of behavior are you exemplifying where you go? What kind of light is seen within you that will cause curiosity to arise out of somebody that don't know God? What will cause somebody to, I mean, like, even though they may not say a word, but yet still you have been identified as somebody different. Not somebody strange. See, you can be a child of God and still not be strange. See, when you become a child of God, you're not supposed to be strange, you're just supposed to be different. Amen. Are you listening to me? In other words, living according to the word, did you not know that a person that is in trouble, they want somebody that they can talk to, somebody that's going to be honest with them, somebody that's going to just tell you exactly, or tell them exactly how they need to handle the situation, and because you have lived above reproach, they're going to come to you. They're not going to go to Pookie. They're not going to Ray Ray. They're not going to Laquita and General. They're not going there. They're going to come to you. Why? Because you have appeared to be different. And when they talk to you, you'll be able to tell them, I am a representative of God. They may not understand that phrase. They're not supposed to. And you can simply say, here's what I mean. I'm born again, I believe in Jesus, and I try to live according to his word. See, you are the church representing God in the earth, so when the world looks at you, what are you showing them? Amen. The bad habits? Do anybody, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> anybody have any bad habits that they refuse to deal with? Oh, that song, that I like to call them the issue still in the soul. Did you not even know a person that get born again? that haven't gone to church and that refuse to go to church, they think that just getting born again solve all of their problems. Mm -hmm. Honey, please. Right. Being born again will solve all of your issues. You can still lie. Mm -hmm. You can still smoke dope. Right. You can still smoke crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. You mean to tell me you can be saved and all that happened? When you ask God to save you, he saved you. But what it is, you become unproductive. You got to give the church to learn how to curb Amen. those bad habits. Amen. They got to be preached on this the power of God. Yes. Yes. The gospel that enters in and drives out. Amen. You hear what I say? It's the word of God that you allow in right. that drives foolishness out. Right. Yes. <laughs> Let me tell you what the Bible says about a child. The Bible says that foolishness is embedded in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction will what? Yeah. Drive it out. The word of God will get inside of your foolishness and drive it out. But you have to let it in. Yes. Did you not know that you can hear the word yes. and don't let it in? Yes. David said, thy word that I hear in my heart that I may not sin against my God. You have to allow the word in. Now let's show, let me show you something here. Show you that you are a light of the world. Let's look at Matthew the the, the fifth chapter. Matthew 5. And we'll look at verses 14 through 16. Matthew 5 verses 14 through 16. You remember just a minute ago I was talking about the light. There was a light on the inside of you. And I know that to some, to some believers, stuff like this sounds crazy, the way that I word it. But when you got saved and invited Jesus Christ into your heart, the very first blessing that you got was the Holy Ghost. He is so important until you want to understand the word without him. So when he came, he brought light with him and you shine bright. And God is warning you. And it's your responsibility. He's warning you to get your mind and your spirit in harmony. Your spirit don't have a problem following God. It's your mind that you have left alone. Have a problem following God. But the word of God 
and God's spirit are one. So the light <coughs> is in you, but you have to let it shine. Now, look at Matthew the fifth chapter, verses um, 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Notice in the 16th verse, listen to what it says very carefully now. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. What, 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 what light is that? It's talking about your godly character and your godly behavior. I'm upset. I was mistreated. I shouldn't have been treated that way. And all of these unsaved people standing around you, you talk about how, how upset you are, how you haven't been treated. You're not going to put up with this so-and-so stuff. But when you go to lunch, you're ready to, to pray with your food. <laughs> Somebody needs to be laying hands on you to get that stuff out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to let your light shine. Amen. When stuff bothers you that you do, did you not know that that's an indication to you ought to be right up? That the Holy Ghost is trying to get you beyond that behavior that has held you back? Mm -hmm. Did you not know that your behavior holds you back? Yes. Have you ever wondered why I don't ever get promoted on my job or why don't somebody ever come and get me to do this for Christmas or whatever? No behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer, yes, but you haven't exemplified that kind of behavior. Right. You haven't shown yourself to be different. You haven't allowed your light to shine among men. Yeah. It's there, but you keep it here. So then, when the world looks at you, people of the world, your friends, your ungodly friends, when they look at you, what do they see? Now I'm going to say something that's probably somebody would like to debate and what have you, but that's okay. I want to tell you this. You get saved, born again, showing up the word ground and rooted in you. People that hang around you that's unsaved should get to the point where they feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you don't try to hide your Christianity. Mm -hmm. Why are you trying to hide it? What are they giving you? In other words, you, you, you're you born again. You watched that the blood of the Lamb have been made whiter than snow and what have you. Okay? You are, you are, you're in a room full of unsaved folk. You're scared to pray over your food. Hmm? You're in a room full of unsaved folk. they smoking and drinking. You don't pass it. You sit there. Get up and give them one of these. Walk out. See, because number one, see, God put you there so that your behavior ought to be different. And guess what? They'll see the difference if you allow the light to shine. Yes. I came to Omaha with the guy that I met in the Navy. He was from Omaha. I don't call him by the name. We were drinking buddies in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Whoever you saw me, you saw him. Man, I mean, like, we ran all over San Diego together. All over, man. We, we, we were together, but I mean, I thought he was my friend. We was, as long as I kept the whiskey bottle in my hand. See, well, something happened to me when we came to Omaha. Mm -hmm. See, when God rearranged my geographical location from San Diego to Omaha, mm -hmm. and I got saved. Mm -hmm. well, I got here in February 1980. And around April, I got saved. I found him below. And you know, if something happened, man, something miraculous. That was salvation the miraculous. And it happened to me. And man, I, oh man, what, what in the world happened to me, baby? Oh, Lord, I just feel 
feel good. Mm -hmm. I thought <laughs> that my friend was going to be happy for me. Mm -hmm. But he looked at me and lived like I was from another planet. Mm -hmm. Because I was talking about, man, you know, let's just start going to church, man. No, man, like, no, I can't drink no more gin and stuff, man. Like, I, no, I don't want to smoke that in, in no more. Heaven. See, his, his wife mm -hmm. was happy. Mm -hmm. See, because first of all, when a man gets saved and born again, when he yields to Christ, he'll be a better husband to his wife. And vice versa, a woman will be a better wife to her husband. But you know what? He stopped hanging around me. You know why he stopped hanging around me? Because I allowed the light to shine. The little light what I had. See, the light don't be as bright then as it can get. You have something to do with how bright the light Amen. gets. You got the source. All you got to do is just let it loose. And your light will blind somebody if they're not coward. Are you listening to me? So, he stopped wanting to hang around me. I'm talking about my best friend that we used to drink together. Right, right. Now all of a sudden they ain't going to go together. But when I started talking about Jesus, right. see, the fact of the matter is one thing, when you come to Jesus, it's miraculous. It's, it's so miraculous until God has to, see, first of all, he used the church to get you to the place where you can ask him to save you and then God does something miraculous in you, give me his spirit in your eye, all of a sudden it's open to a totally different world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he'll tell you, now, go get plugged into a church so you can learn how to serve me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you learn how to serve him, and when you start watching him do those impossible things in your life, because there ain't nothing impossible to him. Right. Maybe right. impossible to man, but it ain't impossible to God. Right. <clears throat> so when God started doing these things, mm -hmm. you start to take notice. Mm -hmm. You were saying that, how in the world could this happen? Mm -hmm. How could that be? Jesus. I didn't believe that that could ever happen. So what God is doing, God is setting you up mm -hmm. so that you can serve him better. So that when the world looks at you, they can see him in you. Nobody in the world can make the claim that I have seen God. I have seen Jesus. The closest you're going to see God, getting to, getting to see God, is going to be through one of his representatives. And you are a representative of God. Is anybody listening to me? Let's look at another verse. 2 Corinthians. We look at the sixth chapter, Second Corinthians six. When you get there, say Amen. That's Second Corinthians six, uh, three verses sixteen through eighteen. Are you there? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the living, for ye are the temple of the living God. Now, if I can say it this way, my body. It is the temple of God because God dwells in this temple. Let me read it again. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God has said, listen to what God said. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you unto myself, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my son and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So, you mean to tell me that if God is walking and standing up in you, you mean to tell me a person that don't know Christ can't see that? Why can't, see, I mean, they, they're, not, they're not seeing God. They're seeing what you exemplify. They're seeing your behavior. They're hearing how you speak. Because he's in you. You remember I told you earlier? That I'm sitting at the house. I'm looking at my watch, waiting on that. I mean, just, just, just an example. It happens all the time. It was just yesterday. Five minutes after I said, where the world the hair is? And the Holy Spirit spoke up to me and said, well, <clears throat> you didn't tell Larry to come by the house. You just simply told Larry that uh, you needed his help. So Larry assumed that you meant 
we're going to the church. I said, oh, okay, thank you, Holy Ghost. I jumped in the car. I put the uh, place of him in the car myself. It wasn't that heavy. But you know what? I tried to pick up something heavy, but you can get help. Yes. So I, I drove out here in Bel Air. Because he's in you. So you got to live it. You got to behave it. I'm going to say this again. You forfeited it. You gave up your life. Now let me, let me, let me put it this way so some of y'all can understand. The Pittsburgh Steelers, let's just say supposed to play the San Diego Chargers. The Pittsburgh Steelers are supposed to fly from Pittsburgh because they're going to play in, in Los Angeles Chargers in L.A. Let's just say if Pittsburgh don't show up, they forfeit the game. They gave up that game. Okay, so when you acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and ask him to come into your heart, you forfeit it. You're like, you gave it up voluntarily. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to God. So God is saying that I want you now to get so much of me in you so that when the world looks at you, they can see me in you. I'm talking about the change of your behavior. The change of your vocabulary. Did you not know that you got the exchange of vocabulary, of worldliness, to a vocabulary of godliness? In other words, I'm not talking about being so heavenly minded, you're no more earthly good. Amen. I'm just talking about man that just being truthful. Right. Amen. Doing stuff right. Yeah. If you tell somebody that I see it at 5 o'clock. See, now, 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 I don't have any better sense. Now, I mean, to, to, to understand anything else. You say at 5 o'clock, I'm looking for you at 5 o'clock. Amen. I wasn't mad with Larry. I just said, well, Larry, 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 don't do it. The Holy Ghost said, well, you didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. But now, on the other hand, if you tell me something, I'm expecting for you to do it. Mm -hmm. See, but a lot of times, you don't do it, and you don't, don't think anything about it. Mm -hmm. Did you not know that your word is your bond? Mm -hmm. So you tell an unsafe person that you're supposed to do something, and then some unsafe person, hmm. all these Christians are just alike. Mm -hmm. Don't do what they say. So why do I want to be a, become a part of that? Come on. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Now, let me go on. Am I helping anybody? Yes. Yes, you are. See, it's time for us to get beyond just hearing these kind of things yeah. and start doing it. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. You have to understand that God's intentions in your new birth is to transform you in such a way. That your change would become evident. So when the world looks at a child of God, they will see the Christ in you, the hope of oh, glory. He put you in, he deposited, if I will, his spirit in you. So that his spirit can help you with the necessary changes. Honey, you have to change. You will have to change. I mean, there was something that, that, that I just refused to do. I'm not going to get specific on you. You might say, I wonder what Pastor Mitch refused to do. I just refuse to do stuff that's wrong. Do I ever do anything wrong? Of course I do. But he has provided salvation. He has provided forgiveness. And I just simply go and say, Lord, I did wrong in the day. I didn't handle that situation the very best that I can. So would you forgive me? He said that if you would confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So there are some changes. And you might want to say, why do certain people don't want to be around me? <laughs> Could you be truthful enough to say that I get on full nerve? <laughs> would you be truthful enough to say that? No, no, you won't. <laughs> it's everybody else's problem. I'm right. I'm going again. I'm saved. But don't nobody want to be around. I mean, you know, when Jesus was on there, people flocked yes. to him. Yes. And that kind of behavior, Christ is wanting us to get that kind of behavior in us. Yes. Now, I'm, 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 I'm going to show you this, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and close. I'm going to show you this. Christ chose how many men? Twelve, wasn't it? Yes. He chose twelve men. If you would do a study, on the first 12 disciples that Jesus chose, you will find that they came from all walks of life, and one of them was a devil. Mm -hmm. One of 
them other devil. Mm -hmm. One of them other thief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you, I mean, that you know, they, they, they came from all of them. Oh, a publican? Mm -hmm. Tax collector? Mm -hmm. I mean, they came from all of them. You know how Peter was? Peter was always saying something out of term or whatever. I mean, they came from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. Now, Pastor Reese, why are you saying that? Here's the reason why I'm saying it. So that when the church began, and, and when people that come into a certain congregation, and when the pastor or the leader of the church get to run into Jesus and talking about well, Jesus, you know, like I'm trying to preach, man. Folk don't want to listen to what I got to say. Lord, they're giving me all kind of problems or whatever. And Jesus will say that that's the reason why. I chose and did not hide the kind of people that they were so that you will understand that as I had to go through it, you're going to have to go through it also. So ain't no sense in talking about when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell the Lord about all of my problems. You're not going to do that. When I get to heaven, I'm going to tell the Lord how I was mistreated and how people misused me, people abused me, whatever. The Lord is going to say, well, they, they, they crucified me. Right. Amen. Right. Come on. So I allow myself to go through that so that when they come against you, you have some backbone to stand to know that as my father raised me from the dead, he'll get you out of that little trouble. Amen. I ain't hear what I'm saying. Yeah. I said, my father. Raised me from the dead, and you mean to tell me you can't trust him enough to get you out of that little trouble? Come on. Come on. He knows what kind of trouble you're going through. Now, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me finish. Let me finish. Am I okay? Did you not know that the church is God witness for the world to find? To find him. The church now is God's witness for the world to find him. World not gonna find God without the church. I, I, I see somebody like that so powerful. What angel got you saved? Whether a man or woman, boy, girl, talk to you, got you saved. And if they saved, what were they a part of? What the church? So without the church, nobody's getting to heaven. That's how come God keep calling preachers. That's how come preachers keep teaching. Preachers keep preaching. Preachers keep proper sight. Preachers keep evangelizing. Preachers keep doing what they're supposed to do. Pastor Reese keep preaching on YouTube. If I get to go back to YouTube, I'll go back again. But I'm not going to stop preaching because I'm going to have to stand before God to give him an account. Because God will tell me there are more people that will hear you on YouTube than in your congregation. So if your congregation don't want to hear you, I got some folk that I've sinned to hear you. So when the world is looking at the church, what do they see? What are you showing them? You're, after this message right here, some of you are going to be very careful about what I've said today. You're going to be thinking about people are looking at me. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. You can win somebody to God apart from your speech. You can win somebody to God based upon your behavior. Mm -hmm. And you can drive somebody away from God yes. real quick with your behavior. Mm -hmm. hmm. I thought she was. I thought he was. And y'all know I'm telling you the truth. You know I'm telling you the truth. Get a hold of this concept. That you are the church. And the church is you. You don't need to go to a building to have church. You can have church by yourself. Amen. Amen. All you need is Amen. this. And get on your knees or get on your feet and get the clapping. And I, I tell you what, you, sometimes you have a much better time by yourself than you will all over. Because there won't be no hindrance. Amen. Amen. Everybody looking around, how come they on oh, that like, thing? Jump up talking about hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I, 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 can't, I can't get involved in all of that. And see, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you that that stuff is true. The first time I went in, the first time I went into a good hallelujah meeting, I was still young in Christ. Still young. Probably within a few years, still young. Hadn't been exposed to a lot of stuff, a lot of deeper things of God. And my brother Larry took me to this place. And man, I got in there. First thing, this lady got up and started singing the spirit. 
when I say singing in the spirit, she was singing in, in another language. Then they got to prophesy. They called me up front and then read me like an open book. Folk did not know me from nobody and were telling me that I was in the ministry and telling me where I was from and telling me how long I had been in the ministry and telling me what God was going to do through me and what I just, I was just bawling because they had read my mail. Are you listening to me? And so, these things are true. These, these things are true. So, God wants to use us. Now, nobody is going to get to hell unless they have been contacted by the church, the body of Christ. So, while we sit and talk about like, I got mine, they can go on it. Mm -mm. If, if, you, if you don't feel comfortable about talking about it, yeah. then behave. Behave. Let me say this now, I'm through. If you get saved, the people that you hang around with first are going to be the first one to see it. They may not accept it, but they're going to see God's hand on you. All you have to do is just lift it. You'll get an opportunity to present it. Just keep living it. So that when, when God point a person that's unsaved in, in your direction, you'll be able to say it. And the next thing you know, that person will acknowledge that they need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And guess what? God will give them what they need to get saved. And God will point them to a church. Amen. So you are the church. The building. It's not the church. So give the Lord a hand, somebody. Thank you.